morning. Good morning. There we go. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome to uh, to Rooted Fellowship on this long weekend, uh, cold uh, youth day. Uh, so much to say about this particular day, but um, but I'm glad you guys are here. You could be anywhere else. You could be uh, on holiday somewhere. You could be in bed uh, under some warm blankets, uh, but you are here, and for that I am incredibly thankful. If we haven't met, my name is Oni. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship, uh, and it is a tremendous privilege. Uh, we are, as Pastor Waite said, we are in a sermon series that's titled Family Matters. We're actually wrapping up this morning. Uh, it's a three-part uh, series, and so... Uh, if you've missed any of those, I'd encourage you to jump on uh, our various uh, platforms where you can access the sermons, whether it's by audio or video, uh, and catch up on them. I think they've been incredibly helpful and, uh, and, and just deeply encouraging and convicting in so many different ways. Um, but to, today, this morning, we wrap it up uh, by talking about parenting. Um, and, uh, and this one's going to be quite an interesting one um, because the, the Bible doesn't necessarily give us a whole lot to work with when it comes to parenting. Um, but we'll have, uh, like we've done over these last few weeks, uh, a few people sitting up front, a panelist that we're going to walk through some questions. Uh, some of them have been sent um, by you and some of them I just thought through in terms of, hey, what would be helpful for people to know? Now, before I jump in, um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm just going to give you 10 verses. So I'm going to be super quick this morning. I'm just going to give you 10 verses on parenting that I believe are super helpful. But before I do that, uh, let me go ahead and tell you that next week we kick off a brand new sermon series. Um, so if you are journeying with us, if Rooted Fellowship is your home, then you know that we have been in the book of Psalms for quite a while. Um, it's kind of a 16-week uh, or 16 part uh, Psalms series. Uh, we're doing uh, eight and eight. And so we wrapped up eight and we're in that break now. So family matters. And then next week for two weeks, uh, we'll be in a sermon series on mental health. All right. So mental health. What does the Bible say about mental health? How are we to think about our own mental well-being? All right. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'd encourage you to uh, be at those, and uh, and I encourage you to invite people who uh, maybe you think would tremendously benefit from something like this. Um, what does Jesus have to say about our mental well-being? All right, so over the next two weeks, and then we'll jump back into the book of Psalms. will be a lot of fun, right? So part two, we'll turn the tape around and stick it back in the machine, okay? Um, but uh, this morning, we're talking parenting. So like I said, um, you know, the Bible doesn't necessarily give us a step-by-step uh, instruction manual. Um, that would have been tremendously helpful. Uh, trust me, it would have. If you're a parent, you'd be sitting here going, you should be saying amen. Um, anywhere between Malachi and Matthew, all right, it's about 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, and I'm pretty sure that's enough time for God to have given us some step-by-steps on how to do this parenting thing. A cheat sheet would have been helpful, all right? Now, I don't condone cheat sheets. Please don't cheat on anything. Um, but in this regard, it would have been very, very helpful. But unfortunately, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. While there isn't any uh, specific kind of instruction manual on this parenting thing, there are several verses in the Bible that speak to it, that speak to parenting. And, and we need to hear them. And we need to unpack them. And we need to understand them. We need to make our way through them because this parenting game is hard. Let me say that again. This parenting thing is hard. It's not easy. I don't care what people tell you. I'll always tell you the truth. It's hard. And so, and so we need to understand, okay, God, what is it? Because, because this is a gift, and you'll see that in a moment. It is a gift from God. Then, then God, how, how, am I, how am I to handle this? How am I to navigate through this? What does it mean to be a good parent? Like I said, there's tons of verses that speak on parenting, but we don't have time. In fact, I would rather have you hear from our panelists this morning. They are incredible. Um, but let me do this. Let me give you 10 verses, all right? 10, 10 passages that speak on parenting. In a sense, just to whet your appetite on this parenting thing, uh, this gift that comes from God. And so here they are, 10. You guys ready? I'm going to go really, really fast. Number one. First and foremost, we must acknowledge that children are a gift and a wonderful blessing from the Lord. Even on a Monday morning when you're doing a school run, okay? You need to know that, listen, as crazy as this is, 
They are a beautiful gift from God. Listen to, to Psalm 127 verse 3. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. You need to know that. That's number one. Number two, parenting is about disciplining and discipling children towards developing a deep love and devotion for Jesus. It's about disciplining. Now, I know that's a word that many of us don't like. And discipling. Here's the thing. Discipline and discipleship have the same root word. It's telling us that, that, that you cannot effectively disciple someone without discipline. And, and in a time where all of, like many, let me not say all, many of us, we don't like authority. We're very anti-authority. But you don't recognize that that's how God has built this thing. That if you are going to effectively disciple your children, then you must discipline them. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And all of this is towards developing a, a deep love and devotion for Jesus. Let me read Ephesians 6 verse 4 here. It says, fathers, and I love the fact that here, like the Bible does this a lot. It often talks to fathers when talking about parenting. So fathers, listen up. This is not to exclude mothers, but, but fathers, listen up. Paul writes, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Another one says, fathers, do not, how do you say this word? Hmm. Okay, fancy. Do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. Why? Because we want our kids to be encouraged. Number three. Parenting, parenting is faithfully teaching your children the scriptures and who they are about. You, you, you can't hand your kids over to children's ministry and go, you know what, you'll do all the work, I'm just going to sit back. Can you hand back to me a fully developed Christian? No, no, we come alongside, that's what the church does, comes alongside you as you do this. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 6 and 7 says this, these words that I'm giving you today are to be on your heart. Repeat them to your children. I think some, sometimes the problem is, is we, we can't do this because we don't even know what God has said to us. So it's easier sometimes to repeat hashtags and to repeat like these really cool sayings that we find on Instagram. Your kids don't need that. They need the word of God. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. You see the point here? Talk about the word of God. Talk about God. Number four. Parenting is talking to your children about the incredible things that God has accomplished throughout history and in your life. It, 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 it's... It's, it's about a life filled with testimonies and all you're doing is telling your children about them. Psalm 78 verse 4 says this, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord and his power and his mighty wonders. I mean, we've just sung it. Open up my eyes in wonder. Parents, sometimes, sometimes you've got to use great discernment here, but sometimes you've got to bring your children into the difficulties and the challenges of life and then show them how God works through them. Yeah. See, what many of us tend to do, and I find, sometimes I find the temptation in this, it's like, I'll go, you know, I just want to keep all these difficult things away from you, but then when life one day hits them in the face, they go, I have no idea what to do. Yeah. We should tell them about how God is constantly working in our world. All throughout history, he's been working and he's working in our lives. Number five, it's, it's inviting children to turn to Jesus. I think about that for a moment. God, God gives you, he gifts you these children and they become your one mores. Automatically, they are your one mores. That exercise that we did, Last year when we wrote out our one mores, it was, it was last year, right? We wrote out our one mores. Like if, if your children don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that should have been the first name. 
It's inviting children to turn to Jesus, to confess their sins, to receive the Holy Spirit, and to be baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 39, Peter replied, after preaching this incredible message, repent and be baptized, each of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And he is in the business of calling many. Number six, parenting is directing children towards the correct path. And, and, and where is that? If, you, if you're like, I'm, I'm a little new to this, I'm unsure, like, where is this path? I didn't get the GPS. What's the Christian GPS? Let me go ahead and tell you. It's towards the good shepherd. The correct path is towards the good shepherd. It's, it's to whatever Jesus says that you should do. That's all that you should be doing. You'll be like, listen, I just, I just want to point you towards Jesus. You should be doing what Jesus says you should do. And they should see that in your own life. Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. What a promise. Number seven, parenting is providing, not spoiling, is providing for the needs of your children. First Timothy 5.18 says, but if, any, it's, but if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This is a big one. Oof, I don't have time. But I'll say it anyway. Um, this is one, this is one that, that, that I find myself having to say often, especially in the church planting world. Sure. There are way too many church planters and, and pastors who, who are going, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do everything that I can for this church, and then they neglect their family. It's so important that in, in Acts 29, Africa, it's one of the questions that we ask right up front. So we say, what is your plan to provide for your family? This is a great vision, and I can see that you, you love the Lord, and, and you love your city, and you love your town, and you love your village, and you want people to know Jesus. That's beautiful. This is an incredible vision to plant this church. But what is your plan to provide for your family? Because the Bible's clear. Because if you don't, you are worse, worse than an unbeliever. Number eight, parenting is correcting and disciplining children. There it is again. And when we do this, when we correct and when we discipline, this is a sign of love. It's a sign of love. Now, and, and it'll give you joy and peace. Well, you've already spoken about discipline. Yes, but because we live in the world that we now live in, I have to say it twice. Proverbs 29 verse 17 says this, discipline your child and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. Parents, do you wonder why some of you, like, you have no peace of mind? Check if you're correcting and disciplining. Number nine, as parents, we must do everything in our power to maintain, to create and maintain harmony and stability in the home and ensure a safe environment for our children to grow and flourish. That's important, that's, that's what we must do. That, that we create and maintain harmony and stability in the home, not chaos. You know, a lot of times, I, I think there's a lot of chaos in homes, largely because parents are selfish. You, you fail to recognize that this, this parenting thing requires self-sacrifice. These kids are not a puppy. And I hear it these days and it's super weird, like how people talk about their dogs as children. I'm like, it's not the same. It's not. Like I get it, like, woof, woof, woof. Okay, cool, that's amazing. Get them medical aid and get them all that good stuff, but they are not children. It requires self-sacrifice to create and to maintain this home where these little ones will flourish. And then the last one, I'm gonna call up the panelists. 
parenting involves living in such a way that you are not only an example to your children, but also individuals that they look up to and admire. Let me say that again. Parenting involves living in such a way that you're not only an example to your children, but also individuals that they look up to and admire. Proverbs 17 verse six says this, children are the crowning glory of the aged. I like that. Parents are the pride of their children. You know what this verse is saying? It's saying that, that as you get older, as you, as you transition into being a grandparent, um, you, you're, you're in a sense, like, your, your grandchildren become this, this glory. I, I think of, of grandparents who sit on a chair, this really big chair, and they have the, the, their grandkids around them. It almost looks like a, the shape of a crown. And all they're doing is just giving wisdom and wisdom and stories and wisdom and stories. It's absolutely beautiful. But then we're told that parents are the pride of their children. That, that, that kids should go, you know what, I'm proud of my mom and dad. I see how they tirelessly work, how they sacrifice, how they love, how they give of themselves. I am proud of my parents. And, and when these things happen, this is what creates legacy. I think too many of us, we think legacy is, is like this, this building that has your name on it. I mean, it's pretty cool, don't get me wrong. But you have no idea who the next CEO will be 50 years from now. We, my wife and I went to a restaurant the other day, I'm not gonna say which one, and it was established in 1970 something, which is pretty cool. Um, food was, mmm. And, and I went, I think that guy's probably going, that's, that's not what I was going for. <laughs> the steak you just ate, I'm really sorry, that was not what I was going for. Because you have zero control. You have no idea. But, but, but this kind of legacy where, where, where you're, you're, you're pointing people to Jesus and like regardless of where they end up, you just know, hey, there is a home that loves Jesus and wants to make him known. That's the legacy you want to leave. Let me say this real quick. Um, it's important to note that, that none of these things are achievable without trusting yourself and your children to Jesus. We could talk about parenting until next week. But if, if I don't tell you that, that to, to do this, you need Jesus, then all of it is in vain. All of it is in vain. And so we are to pay careful attention to our walk with God. Hear me, parents. Pay careful attention to your walk with God. Because your little ones are always listening and they're always watching. And it's something we've recently realized with our nine-year-old, where she'll say stuff and we'll be like, where, where, did you, where did you hear that from? I thought we were whispering. <laughs> they are always listening and they're always watching. And so when you think, where, where did you learn that from? We don't talk like that. It's like, well, actually, you talk like that all the time. And so pay careful attention to your walk with Jesus. Let me stop there um, and go ahead and invite our panelists this morning. Uh, it's uh, uh, back again. Huh? I'm telling you, man. Y'all's favorite. Um, I'm going to have uh, my wife, Confidence, come up. Um, and then uh, as we walk through parenting, uh, we couldn't think of better parents uh, in our community, uh, they have three amazing uh, children, and I generally mean that, um, three amazing children. Uh, I would happily leave uh, our kids with you guys um, for an extended period of time. <clears throat> Notice, I didn't, say for, I didn't say forever, but for an extended period of time. Um, I'd like to call up, uh, uh, he's already here. I mean, look at that, guys. I won't, I won't, say, I won't say anything. I didn't even look at you. Like, I, I didn't expect you to be there. Um, but uh, Ed, uh, who is known as Edgar, I believe that's what it says at the back. Yes, Edgar, out of respect. Uh, and Clarinda Sishi, um, thank you uh, for, for doing this this morning. Um, they, they serve in various ways here at uh, 
at, at Rooted Fellowship, I could, I could list it. I mean, we've just uh, heard Clarinda um, lead the band in, uh, lead us in worship in a time of singing and praise. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And, uh, and then um, it uh, serves here on just, you know, look, you know them, I know you love them. They lead a family group, they, they do so much here and we're so very thankful for them. They're great friends, um, but amazing parents. And that's why uh, we wanted you guys up here just to help us kind of think through this a little bit. Uh, deeper, a little bit further on, on what it means to be parents. Uh, how can we uh, create environments where we're growing uh, as a community, we're growing as godly parents, um, but then that we see our little ones uh, growing and ultimately flourishing in all that God has called them to. And so I'm just going to, uh, we're going to go back and forth with some questions. Um, let me ask, let me kick off with this one. Well, first of all, hello. Friend. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Pleasantries done. Um, let's kick off with this one. How, how, can we, how can we discover each child's unique potential and hidden talents and gifts? You know, I thought I'd start with an easy one. Um, because we all want that. We all want them to be all that God has called them to be. Um, but how do we do that? How, how can we discover each child's unique potential and hidden gifts? gifts and talents. And you can make it as personal as you want. How have you done it? Because you have some very gifted and talented children. Wow. Hello. Can you hear me? Why am I going first? Okay, I'll be the icebreaker. Oh, wow. I think the first thing to establish is that all your children, all our children, well, I don't know about yours, but Every child is so different. Hmm. You know it. I mean, the first child comes and you think it's a perfect combination of the two of you. And then the second one comes and you're like, you're another different one. And then the third one is another different one. Um, but I think starting with the fact that these kids have been designed, hmm. um, not by you, but by God. And the adventure of parenting is to discover um, who they are, actually not what you had in mind. So I think it's, it's good to start there because I, I don't know, it's, it's very easy to try and see what you wanna see in your children because it's what is celebrated, what, is, what you think will make them successful. So every, every parent thinks their child is a genius somehow. Um, and they all are in their own different ways. <laughs> that was a strong laughter. <laughs> Is, is, this, is this similar to like everyone's a winner? Is it like... Is I, it... Well, every child has genius in them, but not... Yeah, yeah. Um, because every child has that unique thing Got you. that they... that just sets them apart, that, that sits on them that says, this is something that no one did, but you carry this thing mm. with such sometimes ease and sometimes um, it can be the thing that is very annoying, sometimes, but it can, it's that distinct thing that rests on each child. If you pay attention, you're going to catch it. Um, and it's not about you, it's not about what the world wants, but I think discovering it is starting by realizing that each child comes with some unique gifting or um, ability even. And it can be personality gifting, character gifting, a sense of patience, maybe someone is musical, maybe someone talks a lot and it can be very annoying, but it actually, pay attention to the thing that stands out. Each one of my children, if you ask me, what stands out with Erin John, I'll say music and patterns and, um, what do we call it, um, Cornelia? <laughs> what? Perfect pitch, right? <laughs> and I could see that from when he was young. He was always drawn towards musical things. Mm -hmm. If you say Kendra, I'll say communication. Because she always could tell you exactly what she thought and she still can. <laughs> um, if you say Elijah, I'll say so many things. I'll say leader and a great cook, but it may change. 
But there's, there's distinct things about our children, it's I think. 12. I know. <laughs> that may change. But you see it from really, really young. And yeah. I think the point is to create an environment that celebrates the emerging person in front of you and not trying to tailor it to what you would like. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. That's good. So I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, I guess at year 17 of parenting, I'll be able to say that. Because right now I'm still at, um, I'm open to their gifts, but I have preferences. <laughs> I want them to do things a certain way. And, um, and I struggle. I struggle because half the time I'm doing that comparing thing of like, if I had your opportunities, I would be doing one, two, three, four, you know, because I'm like, they should be doing one, two, all these things. And that, yeah, anyway, so I think, I'm, I'm still at the point of like, no, but I want her to do this way and this way. And if it's the way I like it, it's like, yeah, this one is in their gifts. Yeah, this one is walking <laughs> in their skills. So, uh, baby steps, I guess. <laughs> yeah, look, I think, I mean, so much has been said. So I'm not going to repeat, um, except to say that um, just coming off of what Clorinda was saying about recognizing that it's, God who created us, God creates your children. You don't create them, you don't make them. You bring them into the world, but you don't make them, he makes them. And what that means is that he also develops them, not you. Um, I think we get deceived by our own narratives. We believe our own press. We talk about child development. Uh, full disclosure, I don't believe in child development <laughs> because I believe it's God who develops your child. I think God tells us, Rear your child in the discipline and training of the Lord. Mm. The gifts will come from him. The abilities come from him. Mm. And usually you discover them by accident. And what's even more amazing is they discover it by accident. Sure. Um, so what I would say is um, try not to focus actually on discovering your kids' gifts. Mm. Try to um, uh, rear and train them in the way of the Lord. They'll discover them probably before you do. And sometimes they'll discover them after they've left you. Sure. sure. Um, and um, lastly, I think it's also very important to try not to, um, uh, which, which happens quite a bit nowadays, to try not to have your kids focus too much on themselves. Mm. Because uh, often people discover their purpose and God's plan for their life when they are working on other things. Sure and serving other people. Mm. So if you're going to raise your children in such a way that they're constantly focused on themselves, that's one of the worst things you could do. Sure. So um, they will discover who they are. They'll discover their abilities. God's in control. It's OK. Um, uh, and, and your job is just to make sure that, you know, uh, I mean, you'll make mistakes along the way. I've made more mistakes than I can count. Um, but to just always remind yourself that actually, you know, God's actually the one that's going to bring it. And what I've got to do is I've got to work really hard to, to try and, and help them stay, for lack of a better description, on the straight and narrow as such, because it's in that, that what you were talking about in the message about that discipline mm. and in serving others that they discover actually who they are. It's good. It's really good. Show sure, was good. I feel like I'm learning while sitting here. Um, uh, so maybe just very, very briefly, because one of the things I had in mind or a question that came to my mind when we got that question is um, there's so many things. I mean, if, if you have opportunities and if you're able to uh, pay for certain things that your kids can do, you want them to explore as much as they can, right? Like if there's do the art program, do the dance, do the, all of those things, all the things that you can afford. When is it too much? And with everything that's just been said now, almost like don't let them focus on themselves, you know, like give them, like they'll discover it. When do you know you're doing too much? And yeah, I mean, I mean, you can't know exactly, but still, is there a point of like, no, but you have to get them to do sport. You have to get them, you know, those things. Maybe some practical things that you think, maybe, yeah, briefly, that they yeah, should Yeah, I mean, it's, that is a tough one. Uh, because what we've discovered with our kids is that those things can run away from you. You can end up being overscheduled. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had uh, points where we were very heavily scheduled and we had to make a choice to say, uh, 
And then we had to speak to them and say to them, you know what, um, there's all of these different things <laughs> that are going on. And I guess, you know, we can spend the whole of Saturday running from one thing to another. I mean, there was one time where, you know, we had, um, you know, we had one child who had a, a music lesson at like seven in the morning on the Saturday and then another child who had <laughs> dance later in the morning and then a sport thing in the afternoon and then during the week there were things in the evening and it was just crazy and we had to pull it back. I, I think, to be brief, the simple answer is I think if you find that you're not spending time with them mm. and you're spending more time taking them to things with mm. other people, sure. then you need to start saying maybe uh, we need to pull things back a little bit. That's what I would say. Um, I think initially we all have in mind that thing we want our child mm. to do. I'm, I don't know about you, but um, depending on the environment you were raised or the things that are important to your own interests, you usually want to introduce your children to the things that you love. So from a very young age, I must say, I don't know if it was a musical gifting, but I'm like, oh, my children, please, the music, ne? we must just hook up on the music. Um, <laughs> Because that was our family environment. Your children get born into something and it becomes second nature and you want to see how far it will go. So I think it's okay to introduce your children to what you see as interesting, um, worthwhile, um, but not many things. <coughs> There'll be one or two things that you think, hey, let me just see if my child will have an interest in this thing. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, I think that some of the basics I would recommend, honestly, in the end, when Ed and I decided, oh, this is too many things, we picked something that was physical, something sporty, and then something of a expressive, cultural, creative nature. And then we were like... One, one. One, one. Mm -hmm. So you can't do three different sports and three different... So either it's... At one point, we got everybody swimming. That was the physical. Mm -hmm. Learning how to swim is a good life skill, especially from a young age. Um, and then people branched off into their ballets, and then some people were like, not good swimmers, so we were like, we're not spending money on this thing. <laughs> this, is, this is not happening. Um, but there's always been some sporty thing and some extra that is maybe unique to the child. Um, and I think sticking to just that as a start is good. And if you can find something you're not paying for, and like it says, driving around everywhere, um, I think we can all do the same thing if we possibly can. Try and see if you can find similar things that can overlap. Um, but I think motive is so important in this one, because you must ask yourself, why, am I, why are we doing this? Is it because confidence is doing it? And the people that I'm roaming the streets with, everybody's child is doing, the what we don't have in therapy session okay <laughs> but the motive yeah just just watch for the motive as to why you're doing running around trying to tick all the boxes and the comparisons um, and simplify your life and you can find cheap things great if you find somebody in the community who's good with crocheting why must you pay for lessons go and visit auntie ban ban and you know what i mean think a little bit creatively it doesn't have to be so lesson after lesson, paid after paid. Um, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. That's helpful because if you don't have to pay for it, I want my kids to be doing it. Um, and they're very um, decisive people, unlike me. They're more like their father. And uh, it's a constant struggle because I want them to, I'm like, there's free public speaking happening here. There's this, this, go do it at school. And they're, they're like, no, I'm not interested. I mean, my youngest said to, us, uh, said to me, <laughs> when I was trying to get her into public speaking, I'm like, your friend is going. You're going to be there. You're going to wait for your sister. She finishes later. And she said, um, I think I'm a pretty good speaker. I don't think I need to go. To <laughs> <laughs> and you know what was unfortunate is that when she has to do her speeches, she's really good. So I was like, OK, self-awareness then. We leave it at that. But for me, I'm like, but she's still, she's still doing, you know? So I think if it's free, I mean, me, talk money, and you're like, free. Do all of it. Do all the things at school. Um, and I think it brings us to the next question, really. It's this, 
I mean, a uh, sense of anxiety that sometimes um, children pick up from different things. But I think with my kids, if I think of my elders, I think um, when there's a school is very demanding these days. I don't understand <coughs> teachers. I don't know what's going on at school right now because the kids are doing a lot. They're exhausted when they come back from school. And then they still get homework. So, yeah, hashtag homeschooling. <coughs> um, but, but anyway, so how, how, how can you, uh, what are some of the ways you could help your child uh, overcome anxieties and fears? And not just with extramurals, but just in general, if your child is struggling with, you haven't answered. Do, do you know, babe? I'm, I'm learning. I'm also <laughs> like, uh, I, I confessed right out the gate. I have oh, no okay. idea what I'm doing. Um, no, no. I'm playing. But yeah, um, I guess if there's any ideas of how to help with anxiety and fears. And yeah. Help. Can I say it real quick, and maybe I'm adding to the question. One of the things that I'm, I'm having to learn, because it's still very difficult, is realizing that um, we are raising our kids in a different season. Um, and, and that's difficult for me, because um, you know, what I grew up with, or what we grew up with, is, is significantly less than what our kids have. They have infinitely more. Um, and, and so there's times where I'm, I'm wanting to impose things on them um, from a, a, a time that doesn't exist yeah. with us. Uh, we don't live like that anymore. We, we can buy different kinds of food. We can, do you know what I mean? And, um, and so I'm, I'm trying to, to learn, uh, not necessarily the thing, but the lesson that I learned from the thing. And then go, how can I, uh, in the environment that they're in now, pull out that learning principle? Um, it requires a lot of work, and I think and sometimes I'm, I'm lazy, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I, I just want to go, hey, when I grew up, I didn't have to X, Y, Z, you know what I mean? And, it's, and, and they're looking at me like, well, why would anybody grow up like that? <laughs> um, so, so, so I think for, for me, it's, I can put that pressure and anxiety on them by doing that, um, where it's like, no, 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 the, the lesson that I learned was brilliant. Um, how can I, with where they are now, kind of pull that out? Um, so it's just look, I guess it's just looking at myself in the mirror and going, hey man, it's, it's not wartime anymore. Uh, we're in a season yes. of, of... Yeah, did I tell you what they're calling you now? Oh, well, Amara in the car. Well, let's, like, let, let, let me find out in the presence of everyone. She's, she's at the back of the car, she's like, I don't want to ask Papa this because he's the no machine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Everything is no first then we can negotiate for a different outcome. Yeah, so no. Like, I'm like, why? You haven't even thought about it. What? It's like, because no sounds like the right answer all the time. 100%. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> okay, anxiety, fears, eh? I like what you said because um, it's okay for children to be anxious and afraid without you feeling like they mustn't be. You know what I mean? I think a lot of times, we, our child is anxious and you think it's ridiculous. Like you mm. think, ah, no, go and talk to the people, man. Just, you know, you, but your child is anxious and afraid of the thing that you're not anxious and afraid about. And I've caught myself so many times just deleting things that actually, it's not you. So to stop and, and really allow your child the space to actually, it's okay to be anxious, even if you think it's ridiculous. Hmm. You've got to walk, we've got to walk our children through that feeling that seems so overwhelming that it's actually standing in the way of something. And it's more important for them to actually see the steps of how do I get myself out of here than you telling them not to be. You know, you know what I mean? So I think as parents, Honestly, I, the older my kids are getting, and that's why you must have lots of children. Because the first one is a little, I promise you, I see the secret to this thing. Me, like I think if I had had like your, yes guys, you become better. I promise you become better. It's good. <laughs> because the first way, hey guys, I, I don't know why they entrust us with such a big thing when you don't know what you're doing half of the time. And then by the time you figure out, it's like they're about to leave the house anyway. But um, a lot of the times, I, I, as parents, we want to wish things away. We mm. don't like the discomfort of a child who seems weak, who mm. seems, because you already 10 steps ahead of what this means. You won't be able to, do, 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 you won't be able to, we love our children just miss independent, miss, you know, 
but it's there's a journey for each child to get a particular place and the job of a parent is to take the steps with them and to not rush growth not rush get you know that impatience is about us and we really need to get out of we need to get out of the way and if you don't know it's okay you feel like this ne oh ne what happens when you go into that room and there's lots of strange people i i don't want to go ne oh that's terrible the best thing you can do is to repeat what they are saying <laughs> just and stay there until you like lord jesus please help me right now i don't know what to do but don't rush out of these discomfort anxious things and you have to ask a couple of questions mm. what do i know about this particular child because our children sorry are so different child number 1 will not have that fear mm. child number 2 raised in the same home suddenly is like then you expect you like where does this come from so know that every child is different we all have different personalities your child who's very sensitive emotionally and doesn't even have the ver verbiage to tell you that when i walk into a room i am a feeler and so as so many things are coming at me that i don't have the language for your child number 2 doesn't feel anything right walks into spaces everything is black and white out they go you have to be patient with that child especially the one that's not like you <laughs> and to actually come down to their level help them to talk through their emotions and not be afraid of them mm -hmm. but i think at the at underneath every fear and every anxiety i think there's a there's a lie mm -hmm. that 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 kind of sustains <coughs> the emotion so if you can teach your child that okay yes feelings are great you say this all of the time but they make very bad um saviors, saviors. yeah so clarinda yeah i know sorry i should know that by now but help your child you all discover okay what am i actually really afraid of what do i believe that is the lie mm. and once you can get to that place we can all look at it your child can also look at it and then you can walk them through what is the truth it's good right but everybody does it you do it together you model it and then show your children that sometimes you also get afraid mm. right talk about it don't be yeah. perfect parent i told my daughter just now she she was like oh it's so exciting you're going on the pan i'm like yo you making me nervous kendra you making me nervous just, me just a, a point true. of practicality yeah. we did i do think i mean we uh, homeschooled all three of our kids the two oldest ones are now in a school i guess a school as in like with buildings and things <laughs> they were in school before but it was a different home school uh and uh, or i should say it was mostly my wife who homeschooled them um and i do think that uh this is not i'm not suggesting that everybody should should be homeschooled necessarily but what i'm saying is i do think it helped from the, in terms of the anxiety because you know for quite a bit of the years of their lives they were not necessarily in a kind of that school environment where those pressures are necessarily the same across the board so i think we were able to pay more attention to them individually um and because of that i'm a strong advocate for the idea that whatever you're doing in terms of educating your kids whether they're in school or whether you are homeschooling them never forget you are educating your kids you are responsible not the teacher not the government trust me i worked for the government if you think the government's going to educate your kids you're in mess you're in more trouble than you can imagine the 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 you are responsible for educating your kids and to the extent that you can apply yourself personally to that and be there that you help to lift that anxiety yeah I'd like to make it known that as views are as views they're not the views of Richard Fellowship. Uh, <laughs> no, but I I I I say this I think it's something that I've learned even though our kids are at a private school and yeah. my 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 thought was like with all this money we pay we're handing them over you better educate and we realizing oh wow. Okay so so what is a hexagon again and you're sitting at the table and so I I think there's there's merit in realizing just recognize that you're, you you are you you are educating your children. 
um, in some shape or form, you're partnering, maybe that's a better word to use, you're partnering with the academic institution. Um, and so don't neglect that, that piece. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. I, I want to I ask this. Like, look, we, we, we have, as, as human beings with a sinful nature, we have the ability of idolizing anything, really anything. Um, and, and parenting is one of those. Uh, I think to a large extent, that's why people tend to kind of not talk on this particular issue um, because there's so much room for you to do what you believe is best for your little one. So what someone does, you might look and go, that's ridiculous. Um, and, and so we just tend to kind of leave things alone. And when we do that for too long, we open up uh, to idolatry. And so um, my, my question is, uh, maybe for folks who are already parents, maybe folks looking to be parents, what does idolizing uh, parenting look like? Um, and, and, and how can one surrender their parenting to the Lord? All right, so what does idolizing uh, or you know, idolatry look like in this area of parenting? And, and how can someone go, you know, and I need to stop doing this and surrender it to, to the Lord? I mean... I mean, I don't want to say it's an easy one for me to answer, but I think of something that I have struggled with for 10 years of being a mom now, is um, I don't struggle with idolizing my kids, but I am, I, I saw it a lot. I see it a lot, like, and that's one of the reasons that I am not in, uh, you know, young moms, zero to three years old ministry, that, that I, I, I don't have the grace for that um, age group mom situations because there is idolatry, hands down. Like, um, and it's always masked with reasons, especially in a room like this where we know information, we can read and we've read about the psychology book and this book of, it's like, no, when I do one, two, three, four, I'm trying to do this for my kid and I'm trying to, but it's like at the end of the day, it's like, no, your kid has been raised to a place that they shouldn't be. Uh, and uh, I think it's often said, you often say at a church, like, it's like when we do that with a spouse, same way when we do that with a kid, we are, like, that, that's going to crush them eventually, like, because they cannot hold whatever you're expecting them to be. Like, they just can't. And um, your relationships change because of how you are so laser focused, like, not a positive laser focus. It's like nothing is flexible, nothing shifts, and these children become the, they basically run the house. You know, it's like what the, how, what the kids schedule, how the kids, you know, they need to be eating at this time, sleeping at this time. Don't you ever uh, mess up their schedule. Because if you mess it up, guess what? You might just mess them up for life. <laughs> for some reason, like there's this thing. Because I think in that moment, that idolatry also just reveals, I mean, idolatry already says that you don't trust God. Like that's the, it already says that. Because you actually think that, all those things that you're doing are going to produce the person, <clears throat> are going to create a certain kind of a person. But we should be entrusting our kids sure. to God because at the end of the day, yeah. you are just a good steward and you are faithful and you're responsible and you do everything that you can do, pointing them back to God because he will form the person who they'll become at the end. So the, the striving uh, that we often as parents, as more, I mean, yeah, I, I want to, I want to, I want to identify with it, but it's not mine. That one is not mine. I've got my struggles, and I think uh, I often say them, but that one is not mine. But I see it, and it's very, um, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking, to be, to be honest, because it can be easily justified, and we can encourage it in a community because it's a sensitive uh, subject. It, it is our children, after all, and they are gifts, and we are responsible for them. Like, and they're small. They can't make it their decisions, so we are responsible for them. So it's very hard to not, to separate a place of idolatry and actually um, entrusting them to God. So, yeah, I don't know if I helped, other than affirm that that is the case. A lot of idolatry happening uh, in communities, in the world, in our space. Yeah, so maybe there's a way to help. Is there relief other than Jesus himself? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm going to speak as a mom because I think this is more in our home. I, I don't think that Edgar struggles with this or has struggled with it, I, I trust. Yeah, but um, I think mothers are so, you carry this child, you bond, the child is born, um, and you are raising 24-7 this, this human being. I think 
it's very easy for, I think, it's easier for a mom to via into idolatry with their children than it is for fathers. Um, I could be wrong. Um, but I think some sympathy for the ones who struggle to find the healthy lines of when am I nurturing and when am I actually smothering the living daylights, you know, like taking up so much air, basically. And I've had to navigate this um, with the Lord's help. I don't think it was full-blown idolatry, but I can see in certain stages of my children's growth and development needing to make a shift. So how can you tell is when there's a healthy, I'm caring for a baby, and then it's the baby is two years old and three and four, and you haven't graduated into the next stage. You, you know what I mean? So you holding on to the previous stage because you, either you're not ready or you love it so much. And it can be the worst is when they hit teenage years and they announce their independence. And you're like, I don't have, to, I, I was hoping that we could still be in the you need me stage. What do you mean you don't need me? So getting stuck in the different phases of a child's growth is an expression of idolatry. Because you have made something more than what it should be. It means more to you that your child stay a particular way than they grow. And so that's a really, really nice check. And I think it requires you just being a very healthy parent. Can just have your own life, please. Um, and it, it just have your own life. It can be very easy to, we all know of the stories of the children leave the house and there's emptiness and your marriage is, not, is, is falling apart because everything was held together by the children. Um, my children knew this from the day they were born. Edgar and I were here and we will be here before you all go. <laughs> and it's in dip, deliberate things that you must do to displace them from the throne that they want to sit on all the time, right? And it's very tempting because then they're small and they're so cute and you're like, oh, you're such a cute queen on this <laughs> thing. <laughs> No, you're cute, but get off. This is not for you. You know, and they, they try to negotiate even themselves, staying in places that they shouldn't be in. So we have to be healthy people. I think for me, I'm blessed that I have a wonderful husband, great friends, and I promise you, my children know I love them very much, but when my friend comes, I am talking for three hours. And please go and do something with yourself. <laughs> right? Because I have spent my whole week with you. <laughs> and no, you are lovely, but I, I need my own. So just having that self, have your own life, have your own friends, have your own husband, have your own stuff. <laughs> and if you don't have it, just pretend, just force your children to pretend to communicate something to them even. And on a deeper level, I think, don't be afraid of inconveniencing our children. Mm. From when our children were young, um, and maybe we were in an environment where this was modeled, when children are born, you don't like hide away until they are five, and then you, they can come to church mm. and, it's okay that they were born into something. So yes, it's an inconvenience, to come and sit in church, but our life was happening before you came, so we're not going to like tiptoe around you now that you've arrived. You're gonna join us. We are in community, join us. We are, you know what I mean? So, so to be very deliberate about creating inconvenience for your children is a great way to just remove that whole, you are an angel vibe. Um, I think listening to you, Sorry, I feel like this has gone in a different... It's good. This yeah. is good stuff. It's um, the conviction that I personally got in that moment. Because uh, like I said, I do not struggle with that part, for sure. But what I then... And it's something I think three years ago maybe, or, yeah, or even maybe four. What I, what I am is actually the opposite of that. So is that I, had, I, I needed to make deliberate um, uh, uh, decisions <clears throat> to say... I need to be at home. I need to be with my kid. I need to think about their schedule because there's a very there's always been a very clear thing in our lives that these kids belong to God. They're not 
it's like there isn't this weight there's there's a weight of responsibility but it's not a crushing weight because at the end of the day like we're, si we're sitting here our kids are in class they're in a different room you drop them off at school so the sense of they move with god like god is personally interested in these children and so we don't have to feel this What's happening with our kids? Like this, it's like it's it's really unnecessary. So for me, I needed to actually repent the other way around, to be like, okay, yes, we know that you have a clear theology of the kids belong to God, but come back and do your part and be more, you know, and be more engaged and be all of those things. I mean, I think there is a tendency we can we can fall into the parts of things that we maybe prefer or understand better, or maybe we've seen the other side and we're like, that's ugly. Mm. that is clearly idolatry then we run to the other end and obviously it's like what is faithfulness and what is in the middle and yeah. what is responsibility yeah i mean i probably i probably between the two of us i probably land on the potential or the danger of idolizing them um just because of how my dad was an incredible father um for the 13 years i had him and mm. and uh and i've said i've shared the story before and <laughs> And, and having to recent, like it recently happened again where our daughter and I'm going, you're rushing her to the hospital and I'm just crying out, she's not mine, she's not mine, she's not mine. Um, because in that recognition is that first and foremost, you belong to the Lord and because you belong to the Lord, God loves my child more than I do. It's, it's hard, it's hard, but it keeps me from putting my fist to the heavens and going, how dare you? Oh my God, God, you love, I know. So it's believing that um, is a big deal. A real practical one is if you're on a date night and the only thing you talk about is your kids, mm. that's concerning. Yeah. I'm not saying don't talk about kids. In fact, maybe carve out a particular time to talk about the kids. What, what do they need? What's going on? What's, but when you're going on a date, if you, you're married and you're going on a date and the sum total of your date is the kids, um, yeah, you've opened the door to idolatry. Um, you, you're still, it. yeah, you're still married to, I mean, I tell, we tell our kids this, like I said to them, and they know, you can go ask them. It's like, who does, who does Papa love more? And it sounds weird, like all of you, some of you are already in your feelings. I can't believe you just said, they're going to become serial killers. No, they're not, relax, <laughs> just calm down. Like, like I, but I say that because I'm like, you know what, you know what, like what they realize is they go, how much must Papa love us now? Because if, like, because they feel that love. But I'm, I'm clearly communicating that the, I have a covenant here. There's something happening here that's very different to what's happening here, but it doesn't mean I don't love you less. So um, it's just some practical things. Okay, I think we should move on. Yeah. Um, at a moment of uh, vulnerability, maybe. <clears throat> what is your greatest parenting fear? And what's your greatest challenge about being a parent? Oh, gosh. Every parenting fear has been realized. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, you know, you, you, you know, at some point, uh, you know, you, you, you name it, uh, uh, your kids realize that you're not perfect, sure. but they realize it much quicker than you expect. <laughs> uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, and I think, you know, the, for every parent, I think, uh, uh, and certainly as a Christian parent, if you, uh, you don't want to lead your children away from, from, from the Lord, away from God. And you don't want to do something that, you know, um, that, uh, that, that, that you know, uh, leads them away from his wisdom. The problem is, you do. And, and then, uh, so you're like afraid of doing it and then it happens. And then you have to, uh, uh, you have to, uh, you know, you have to repent. And yes, uh, people, sometimes it's fine to apologize to your children. Mm. I've apologized to my kids. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's not a bad thing. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, in general that's that. Obviously, there are other things besides that. I mean, we were talking earlier about their skills and abilities and, and whatever. And um, um, sometimes when your kids don't do well in something, you can start asking yourself, gee, you know, what did I get wrong? Yeah. 
uh, maybe we should have spent more time on that uh, that uh, that uh, I don't know English test or math test or whatever it was. Um, uh, you know, maybe your child doesn't make it into a particular, I don't know what it was, event or whatever, and you start thinking, yeah, I should have maybe taken. So those things do happen. Um, so it, it's weird with parenting, you've got fears, and then as you go along during the years, your fears actually get realized anyway. Mm -hmm. it's, it's weird, it's like it's, it's the one area of life where you can't escape them. And it's like, well, I'm afraid this is going to happen, and it happens. I'm afraid that's going to happen, and then it happens. And then you go, gee, this is like uh, something like in the middle of a horror movie. It's like, I can't, you know. So uh, that's, that, that is, uh, that's part and parcel of it. It's good. It's good. Um, look, we alluded to it a little bit, and maybe um, let's not flesh it out too much, but, but how soon should we start getting our kids involved in, um, in church? Um, how... How important is that? How, how do we have that conversation? What does that look like? Um, yeah, and, and without going too much into detail, but it came up. Two years, <coughs> two years is appropriate. Well, I mean, it depends yeah. on, I guess it also depends on what it is. Let me write when that down. Age, age, age appropriate, right? Yeah, like, there's different yeah. age appropriate things. I mean, in our case, um, I mean, our kids got, in, when did you get involved in children's church? How old were you? I can't remember. Um, do you remember? I don't know. It's five. Guys, <coughs> five. 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 Did you say five? He was five. five. Oh, he was five. five. No, no, I'm saying uh, Elijah. Oh, was he five? Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll answer it for you. Great answers, everyone. <laughs> Um, I think we, part of the reason we set it up like that here at Rooted Fellowship is to say, I mean, you can go to a lot of churches, there's nothing wrong with it, you can go to a lot of churches where the minute you walk into the lobby, very fancy, Pastor Wade, the lobby, <laughs> um, there's already a place where you can direct them to where they need to go. And that's totally legit, like I'm, I'm all for it. Um, but the reason we, do, we don't do that here and we have them here is that exposure means a lot. And so as a parent, I would say, um, don't, don't disregard that, don't miss on that. Like, use that as a tremendous opportunity to, one, be in the moment with your little one. Um, let, let them see, let them, you know, check in on them. Are they reading if they can? Are they reading what's on the screen? Um, are they involved in what's going on? Are they, are they listening? And then even post the gathering, I'd encourage you to have a conversation. So what, hey, what, what stood out for you? What, what, what did you see? What did you experience? How good was that song? Why did we sing that song? Did you hear that prayer? Those things are molding and shaping your little one. Like you cannot believe. And I think sometimes, and I know, because parenting is hard. It is hard. The temptation is to come in and just be like, whew, I get two, two and a half hours, depending on what I'm just preaching on, of just like, I don't have to deal with, you know. And it's like, no, use that as a molding, shaping opportunity. What would, you, you hear Pastor Jonah talk about how you can get involved here. Hey, what, what do you think you'd like to get involved in one day? You know what I mean? What do you, what, why is that? So um, I, I think there's, it's just being aware. I loved, I wrote it down here. You said, if, if you pay attention, you'll catch it. I think clearly you said that. It was brilliant. I, I think just pay attention to what's going on around them and the opportunities that the Holy Spirit is using to mold and shape. Um, and, and, yeah, let me stop there. No, 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 I'm done. Because I wanted to say um, what's currently happening with children's discipleship, at least for the age of uh, 10 up, is that there's an opportunity for that group of kids to serve once a month, like that, you know, that mail has been sent out to parents, then they can serve one of the, yeah, if, if they at least come to church, that was a thing, disclaimer, at least three, three times out of a month, then they can serve the other one and then be part of what's happening in the other two. So that's an opportunity, a conversation of like, hey, you, sh you should encourage them to do that. But a story I wanna share about is last year when we had our first um, holiday club. A friend of mine um, who had just had a, yeah, who had just given birth to a kid. I mean, he was about three months, three and a half months, I think. I'm not gonna say his name. The little boy is very presidential. Just you'll see if you see his mom carrying him, it'll be like, it looks like it should be a president or something. But she came with him during holiday club because she was on maternity leave, and she would put him over there and be packing our chairs and be helping out at holiday club as early as like four months. And I think that sounds very extreme, right? It's like, 
you know, in maternity leave, the point is that be at home and enjoy your child because you're going back to work and whatnot. But it's like that is a culture thing. It's something that it's like what you were saying. We, I was doing this before you came. I serve. You're here. We're able to get up. I'm getting up anyway because I think he had a swimming class at like 7:30. I'm gonna go to the swimming class. I'm gonna go to the church and go serve what's happening there in the church. You can see I have a leaning, right? Like it's like, yeah, that's the mom that should be. I mean, obviously that's it's not a rule. I'm just saying, um, just check. Yeah, just check yourself even what you're deciding in terms of like what conversations, what are you doing? And I think when I was thinking of that question, it's exactly what you, it's like modeling. You can talk all you want. They're going to be like, but mama, you never pack any chair after church. I never ever see you packing a chair. They'd be correct. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I'm like, you need to pack chairs after church. Like, but mama, you never do. So it's this thing of uh, you want to keep talking, but your actions are saying the other way. Mm. It's like, yeah, you must serve at church. You must do these things, but you don't serve. Yeah. You don't show up for those mm. things. So it's more about modeling, I would say. Yeah. I th sorry. Um, in, in your mind, be thinking and be thinking because we've got like one, maybe one round left in terms of questions. Um, is uh, a lot of people will tend to think as, you know, lead pastor, Mamaruti, our home is just, you walk in there and then like the Holy Spirit just shines <laughs> and like all the translations open up and, and like, you know what I mean? Our kids read That's Hebrew and Greek. It. Um, it's not, that's not the case. In fact, you know, as early as when we started Rooted Fellowship, um, our youngest was six months and she would just come with us everywhere we went. We would go to, like, in, in the winter and people would be, oh, your child will never sleep. It's like, okay, uh, thank you very much. And we'd get, we'd get home and then the Holy Spirit would put her to bed. So, like, it's, it was, it, because it was so foundational, like, there's, there's, we're just keeping it real. There's moments where we're like, yo, let's just stay in, you know, like, I'm, not, I'm, I'm on leave. I don't have to go preach anywhere. I've got, let's just relax. Kids will come and be like, so, hey, we're, we're, why are we not going to a Sunday gathering? Like, why are we not going to? Like, it's, it's, it's woven into them. Um, another quick story recently, and I'm sharing because I'm so proud of my little one. Um, she was talking to her friends about baptism and being baptized. And, uh, and they were like, yeah, I'd like to get baptized. And, and then she came to me. I was sitting in the car. She was hanging out with them. And she came to me. And she said, look, my, one of my friends wants to get baptized. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and I said, well, I think you know the conversation you need to have with them. And she immediately went, yeah, yeah, I need to make sure that they have surrendered their lives to Jesus. I was like, that's great. So you need to go back and have that conversation. We walked through a number of things of just some pointers that you should hit on. But I'm like, go. And, and for her, it wasn't like this weird, strange thing. It was like, hey, we talk about our one more is here. We talk about being discipled. We talk about, she hears it every Sunday. We're gospel-centered, disciple-making, transcultural. We're just putting it into practice. It's what, it's what Ed beautifully said. We're just, hey, we're just saying, hey, here's the environment. Like, let's, let's do this, do that, do this, and then we watch. Um, so so I, I, don't, don't miss those opportunities. That's all I'm saying is don't miss those opportunities. Um, yeah, we've got one, maybe one last round of whatever you think is a banger. You could even join two questions together and be sneaky that so way. So you want to choose one? I think I've asked. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you guys would like to say as a, like, a, this is, I think this is, this is great. We want to share this on parenting. It's a nugget. Actually, can I help you guys out? Because this was hard for me because I don't want to answer this one. Um, what, what three skills do you think your kid really needs? I, I was like, what? I don't know how skills. to. Yeah, skills. I'm happy to answer that one. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Self-awareness. Oh, yeah. Huge. There are so many grown-ups who, who don't know who they are. I was about are. to say, I'm like, if this is for kids, what's happening to us grown-ups? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's tons of people go, walking around who don't know who they are, and so it's easier to copy. Um, I think at a kid level, like, look, they're growing, so you, you, there's no way a five-year-old is going to be self-aware. Um, that's just not going to happen. But, but there are things that you can, you can help them so that they can develop that in themselves to go, you know, how do, I, how do I course correct? How do I do this? How do I, so self-awareness is a big one. Um, I think uh, discipline is a big one. Um, and, and with that comes authority, with that comes how do I work with others? How do, I, how do I speak up in situations where I feel like something is not right? How do I, you know, so that, that's, that's huge. Again, we live in a world where uh, there is zero discipline. People do whatever they want, go read judges. Um, uh, and then the, the, the third one is how to have fun. Like, and I say that maybe for a church like ours, right? Middle class, on the up, 
Um, we're, many of us are living significantly different lives to our parents and our grandparents, and we're very thankful for them for what they have done to be able to get us to where we are. And, and so sometimes you can be so like, I just need to, and it's like, like when do you have fun? And do your kids, when do you have fun with your kids? There was a big one for us. We went on holiday, started playing cards, and didn't realize how competitive our kids are, to, to the point where one of them just, you know, pray for us. Um, but it was so much fun. And, and, and for them to know that that's, like, God's given us that. He's given us, think about this world, this massive world. For what? Like, so that we might enjoy Him and enjoy the blessings that He's given us. And so I think for me, those are, I think of those three things when I think of our, our little ones. Um, yeah. I'm going to add one, um, because this is something I think I, I inherited. I didn't grow up in a perfect family just to let you all know. But there's, there's something I learned from both my parents that my kids know. When I see signs of it in my children, I, it, it's that thing that says, you're going to be just fine. And it is just the ability to try. Just, it sounds very simple, but just try. Uh, we're not looking for a perfect end result we're not looking for, but I need you to move your body through spaces and not stand in this motionless, I'm waiting to see if I can do it. I'm looking for permission for other people to tell me. I can't figure it out. Just move. And um, I've, I saw both of my parents constantly navigate life with the sense of, I don't know how it's gonna happen but I'm going to try. Um, and, and as a result, we reward our children for, you know, when we see that. Um, if you hear the pep talks be before exams, it goes something like, hey, you know what? You've done your best, but we wanna just, just give it your best shot. It's more about your attitude going into things than the result going into things. Because I, I don't know, if you've grown up in Africa, um, I don't need to tell you that, and it sounds very psychology, but just having that limited belief, limiting beliefs, you just, you don't even, you haven't tried, but you've decided it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. How do you know? So to be able to just dream and go for it, we will reward you for trying and believing and putting faith to stuff than just standing, folding your arms and waiting for someone to tell you. Mm. Um, I love that as a skill for my kids and I, I see that it's done so much for them because you do, it doesn't have to be, you can put them in any environment mm. and they can navigate it mm. somehow, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's good. Let me ask this last one. In fact, uh, I'm gonna, oh. Maybe make a specific here. Okay. Yeah, this one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I, it's good that you brought that up because I also want to bring in the entire um, community here because I know we're talking parenting, but um, you can be a, a parent figure in so many ways. And in fact, so many of you are that. Every single children's discipleship teacher is that, um, is a, a parent figure to our little ones. Um, so, so I want to incorporate this last question here is, is how do we keep the balance between wisely monitoring our child's peer influence um, and giving them enough kind of personal space or room to make their own decisions. Like, how do we, how, how does that play itself out? Because uh, to a large extent, the, when they start going to school, they spend more time at school than, you know, in many ways than they do in, in other places. Um, so how, how, does, how does that work? How do you balance monitoring that um, and at the same time going, but I want to give you space to make your own friends. I want to give you space to, you know, hang out with so-and-so. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think it changes as the, over the years. <clears throat> so let me put it like this. When, you know, at, there's a certain age uh, with children where there's no such thing as personal space. Mm -hmm. you, you, there's, when they are a certain age, you don't come to me and ask for personal space. You're too small for personal space. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it... You have to understand the phases at which they're at. The same is true for relationships and friendships. When a child is a certain age or below a certain age, when they're too young, the only friendships they're going to have are with people that you know 
And the only time they're going to be interacting with those people is in your presence, either in your house or the house of that person that you know. So there's a certain stage. So we don't start out by saying a personal space and you're going to go off and be whatever, obviously. But as they get older, you obviously you just adjust as you go along. I think the crux of the question is, is at that level, probably, I don't know, preteen, teen, when they are becoming more independent um, um, and so forth. And actually, you know, I think, I mean, in our case, part of that is we bounce off of each other. This is the different personalities of mom and dad actually come in to that quite a bit. Um, you know, by nature, the dads are more suspicious and exacting. Uh, they, you know, as the kids get older, you know, they're the reminders that, uh, you know, um, I'm watching. And some of the people that I'm watching, you know, there's a cricket bat in the, um, in the, in the garage or in the, in the whatever. Um, but at the same time, um, as Clarinda said earlier, it's, it's about not being anxious and worried about them when they go. Uh, because you have spent that time, you know, rearing them and teaching them wisdom and teaching them to, you know, it's all about that period of time early on so that you're not panicking because now they're teenagers and they don't know how to interact with people and it's like, you know, we're now going to pull things back. Um, it's a lot easier if you're not having to do that um, in, in friendships and interactions and so forth. The same goes with personal space for teenagers. You, you know, I mean, in our case, uh, we're, we're blessed, we're able to, you know, we have a home where the kids have got their own rooms. You know, we don't really worry too much about too many things in that regard. And um, so they've got plenty of personal space, as far as I can tell. Um, and, and when they go, either to school or they go to meet with people and so forth. It's, you know, the lines of communication must be open. Um, we're not having to force our kids to tell us whether they just tell us. It's just part of our, mm. I guess, family life and that makes things quite a bit easier. So I think in summary, laying the right foundations makes it easier when they're older um, as mm. opposed to having a situation where you're having to, you know, um, uh, you're having to engage in a, mm. what, what, like a mistrustful relationship, which, which makes it more difficult later yeah. on. Yeah. I, I really want to add to this one because it's a very deep question you've asked, but it's, you know, it's, it seems like a very shallow answer, um, but a lot of the root system of some of these things that now you need to monitor, now you need to, needs to have been done um, from a very young age. And, and we can't despise making healthy things, healthy relationships very attractive to our children. That is our job, I believe. You, you make it attractive so that they catch it and make it their own. Mm. Eventually, I can't be selecting friends for my children. You know, I'm very grateful it's funny, some of the things that are, you don't explicitly teach your children, they catch it and then you watch them do it and you're like, oh, when did you learn that? But then if you backtrack, you realize you, it's been modeled because it was important to you to create a family, a home that is healthy, healthy relationship between mom and dad. So that thing that we are doing when we are creating healthy situations here is what they're picking up to help them with what does a healthy friendship mm. look like. And it's almost like, you, not, not everything can be guaranteed, but you make it so attractive that they're not going to want to be around dodgy people, mm. that it will be so disturbing to them. You get what I mean? Um, and it's not by all the things that you tell them. That's mm. the problem with children. It's amazing. I think. I don't know what the, I think there must be some kind of research that says that 90% of what you do is what they, ca they catch rather than the 10 that you tell them. It's what you model and what you make 
valuable in your home that then will shape the decisions that they make. Because eventually, it's scary, guys. I'm, I won't lie, ne? It's wonderful when people are toddlers and you plan play dates with Ban Ban's mom and you know, you've picked them, they play together, but then they grow older and at some point you can't be planning play dates for your children. And you want to pray and hope that something has been laid in them that makes them not needy just for people, mm. right? So not needy people because at home you loved, you celebrated, you're, we are a big fan of you. Mm -hmm. So friendship is necessary and you want to live outside the boundaries of your home. Mm -hmm. But the health that has been created here is what you take, you, you try and replicate it wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you know, I think for me personally, the teenage years is the most, I think it's the most beautiful but scariest phase. I want to go back to when people were it's so much easier. I know people aren't sleeping and there's the terrible twos and uh, you know all of those things. But the teenage years are really beautiful because these people are now becoming people you like. It's like, they're not just my children, but I like them. I, 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 I like them as people. I would choose you as my friend. Mm. That's when we're making, that, we're making that transition because it's almost like you watching them take and choose to take some of the things that you thought were important and make it their own. And some of them you're like, Yo, can you make it your home now? Can you make it your own now? But don't force yourself over it and find this incredible, the incredible thing that starts to happen is that your major thing becomes the fact that you are not a, I don't wanna say you're not a parent, but you are more an influencer <laughs> in their lives. You are, you are an influence in their lives. You're not just a hovering presence. You hold, you, you, you have commodity because your relationship with them, the trust that's been built, they, they love you, you love them. And that's the thing that you now have mm. for you actually to have any say or any influence into the choices that they're making. And you want that because otherwise we've raised very compliant little robots who've done what you tick the boxes and then when they leave home, they become people you like, you, I don't recognize you. So rather let them, I'll give you a very good example, very, very quickly. And I, I had a friend there and I could hear, she was hearing the whole conversation. I was thinking, what does Sarah think about this decision I'm making right now? Um, a friend of ours, um, mom passed away, and one of them, the son's grand grandmother passed away. And so we decided as a family, we're going to a memorial, right? But when the time was coming, the boys, you could see the boys had other plans for their afternoon. They weren't feeling the, we want to be there with them, right? So I had announced that that's what we're doing, but then I could, I could tell, mm -mm. Now I had this split moment, where I could have said, no, you're coming. That's what we've decided. But I thought about it the whole time and I thought, so I said to them, you know what? You are free to decide, okay? You are free to choose. We are going, Kendra says she's going, but you are really, really free to go. I'll give you a couple of more minutes and you tell us what the decision is. And that was a very critical, I made that decision consciously because Yes, they chose not what I wanted, but I wanted to specifically communicate that we, I'm giving you an opportunity to exercise your own decision in this thing. Mm. And it was a bargain, and it's a bit of an investment into hopefully something else, and I was willing to use that moment for them to choose. They didn't choose what I wanted, but I was happy for that offer I put on the table. And I think the older kids come, we have to then create those spaces where mm. oh, you might choose it. And then the question is, what do we do with that lesson all the way back round? Coming back again, were you happy with this decision? Do you have regrets? What will you do differently? That's when the influence becomes owned. Mm. And then next time, I may not choose that friend that I chose the first place. Mm. I've learned you were with me. I didn't shame you. 
I was a parent alongside with you, picking up the pieces and then moving forward, feeling empowered. Mm. And then the relationship is kept that okay. way. It's very good. Thank you. I won't say much, I just a quick one, uh, because we're obviously at different stages with our kids. Um, with regards to friends, um, I mean, we're at a stage, we're at a time when we can do plan play dates. I should, I don't. Um, I'm not saying it proudly, I just, it means that I'm as interact with the mummies. Um, but, um, so, so if it's a play date happening, you must know that I really, yeah, like we've spent enough time investing in this relationship and we feel like we like the family enough. Um, so with, with our kids is that they are more like, they're introverts. So the whole family is introverts and there's one big extrovert. Um, and you would think I'd wanna do the play dates, right? But I still have, <coughs> I still have standards with who I want my kids to interact with. So I'm not just gonna hang out with anyone because we're just like, we just wanna be around people. That's not the point uh, because they get influenced by the environments they're in. But we had, our, our eldest really was going on the needy side of friendship. So she was, everything is like, is my friend gonna be there? I need you to see, this. it's like the, the dependency was unhealthy. So it's almost like that is my happy place when this friend is around. And that was a concern, because that's not the direction we want, we want for them. Like, not just for them as kids, but even as adults, right? Like, you don't want to be dependent on a human being, or, like, in that way, in that unhealthy way, of like, my life feels like it's falling apart when this person is not here. I feel depressed, this person is not here. And um, one of the things that came, we didn't necessarily decide that in advance, is when we homeschooled. And we got time to just really work through What's happening here? Why do you always need to be around your friend? Do you have a sibling? Why don't you wanna, why do you prefer outside other than being with your sister and whatnot? And that time allowed us, allowed them to just bond. Like I feel like what we were saying about running around and doing sports and doing these things and you're spending time with your kids is that sometimes then they enjoy the outside more than the people they live with. Because it's a high, right? Like it's like it's people I engaged with when it's fun. Home, it's just reality. It's like we do life here. Sometimes people are saying no. Sometimes people are saying can't watch TV. But anyway, so my point is, when we when she went back to school, it was just a different tune in terms of friendships. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of and it just I feel like you do the hard work with one, and it just they just kind of help you with the next one because they're very decisive. They will not uh, be friends with people that are dodgy. Like they will tell you this person does this and then that, and I don't want to be friends with them. They don't feel like they need to go to all the parties. They'll say, they, they'll get an invite, and they'll say, um, why is this person inviting me to their party? I don't play with them at school, so why would they invite me to the party? I'm not going. I'm like, they're going to this place. There's this theme, you know, formal girl. They're like, no thanks. So I think friendships also need to, especially at that age, they, they cannot be the most important thing in their lives. Like, you can't be like, I need to do all the play dates because they want them. It's like, no, home, let's build this relationship. Home, your sister, your siblings, your father, your mother. So I would just add that, that's it. Brilliant. Gosh, so much good stuff. Um, friends, can you help me thank uh, our panelists um, for today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and... Uh, Question, you answer it. Uh, Sorry, I'm reading the script, I'm sorry. Sure, sure, welcome to Richard Fellowship. <laughs> No, it's cool, I can hear you. My question is, as Christian parents, how would one navigate and how, how do you think one should navigate? Um, like you said, you, you can't decide what a child becomes and you can't decide um, how, you know, how things go. Like all you can do is just try to be a good steward, you know? Um, so if your child is, it comes out as part of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm. How do you steward them um, in love, but also in truth yeah. from a Christian perspective? Because I think 
there's so many people who are suffering, they are dying, literally suicidal, because of that. Mm. Um, they come out or whatever, and their parents are kicking them out because, you know, um, like they have, they don't receive love because yeah. of that. So I just wanted to get your opinions yeah. on that. That's a great question. Not because I'm going to answer the question, but I think this helped a question that wasn't asked. Yeah. And uh, it will be answered because of this question. And it's like, do you know of parents who regret that their children are no longer engaged in church? And how does this happen? And um, I'm not saying just because they then decide to come out as gay or whatnot, is th that means they're not Christian. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, um, I think when I had an answer to that question, I don't have to specifically to yours, but when I answered that is that, of course I do know parents um, whose kids did not turn out the way they would have hoped um, and still hope. And um, I think we are not responsible for the outcome. We input and give and be faithful and teach and, in, uh, and um, expose them as much as we can because we can't change hearts. We can't, you know, like it's been said, we can't decide for them who they become. At some point, it's really like we stop, you know, we send, they make their decisions on what to do. So I think it links up because at the end of the day, um, I think it's different when you're talking about maybe a teenager who's uh, deciding that because that's a different conversation. They're still under your roof. They still very much have, you have all the influence really at that time in terms of, when I say all the influence because you are caring for them, they live under your roof. Because once they're an adult, it's like you can't, what can you do except love them? I mean, you love them even before, but I'm just saying there isn't anything you can do to change what your children end up doing because you are not responsible for who they become. That's a very, very heavy expectation to put on ourselves to say, just because my kid has decided to be one, two, three, four, it's a reflection on something that maybe I did or didn't do yeah. well. Um, but I'm answering that, but I know your question, and I think maybe you guys maybe touch more on this part. The part where she's talking about, um, they have their own situations uh, in terms of trauma and their past, that are kind of now also influencing how they are responding because now they're faced with their children making their yeah, the decisions of yeah, sexual identity the way that they're doing them. I think answering that part, but I just wanted to say that part of like, just emphasizing that there's a point where we stop. You, as parents, we need to recognize where we start and where we end. There's a point where we end. You've done your parenting in terms of like that high input and then the rest is, is God, like God uh, and their relationship with God, so yeah. Um, the, the, the building a family and being a parent is the most difficult and challenging thing ever. Um, I think we kid ourselves to think we don't live in a perfect world at all. And we have the saying, come at the hour, come at the man, right? Um, every family will have something where you are going to be driven to your knees because you won't have, you will have the answers in your head and the ideal scenarios that you had in mind and it will not be that way and that those are the moments when what is truly there must come out and so we are in a war in a sense, those are, we are in a war, we don't wrestle against my child is this, my child is that. This is how I, when I hear a question like that, everything in me is like then, as a parent, you go to war for your child. You don't become the other enemy. You don't, you don't, you, you, that's, no, you go to war. You zip your mouth, you go on your knees before your heavenly father, and you do not say anything that he doesn't say. So, and you don't, it's not a moment to psychologize yourself if you're a parent and you have had, either you praying for the salvation of a child, either decisions are being made that are not what you planned, you know how not in control you are as a parent. And it's very humbling. And the best place to be is humble as a parent and really yielded to being an instrument of God rather than someone who stands in the way. So I think whether your child is a toddler 
or something like that pops up, you are faced with situations that you have no answer for, I would, I would plead the name of Jesus that you are locking yourself and asking the Lord to change your heart as a parent so that you can be an image of God to your child and let him do the work in them. Because as soon as you, it, it's so, so many guilt trips, so many I should have done this, I didn't do that, the blame, and then sometimes parents are too proud. Mm -hmm. So then they distance themselves from the child and you're the problem because I can't deal. Because my whole identity is wrapped around you becoming what I thought. Mm -hmm. And we have to, it's, it's an opportunity for the whole family. Actually, it's not, I don't see a child with an issue as just a child. It's, it's, it's a family we are as a family are going through this. It's not you are going through this, we are going through this. And to come alongside in the moments when people need to love you the most um, and to show you Christ the most, if I don't have it as a parent, I trust and I have had situations where I've had to go and talk to Jesus until he changes my heart and he puts his words on my lips and until he does, I pray and I love you and you must know that I am for you actually. I'm actually for you as a person, not a editor of your sins and the, you know, that I don't know how to explain it. That's what a parent is for me. A parent is that one person in this world who will be with you to, when in your ups, in your downs, they are like that is the call of parenting and they are intercessors as well before God so I know I'm not giving a specific answer but that is the point where you go and find your answers and with God's help you then bring come emerge from that place with Christ yeah. and 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 let's not underestimate spiritual warfare and bringing church family into and around you because maybe someone else has gone through something that could actually walk you through that journey. Um, and then I say just tons of forgiveness for the child who's rejected by their parents, right? And grace for the parent who is in this place. Um, yeah, that's so, what I would yeah, say. There's a lot here and I wanna be as, as brief as I can. Um, so I, I wrote it down. That's the only way that I can walk through it um, is you speak of trauma, and, and that's a real thing. Um, we, this conversation could have gone in multiple ways. Uh, we live on a continent that is tremendously traumatized for a number of reasons. We could have gone in the direction of the lack of uh, male figures and fathers in the home because of systematically what's happened, but also just because of sin. So we could have gone down that way. Like I often spend time with uh, many black fathers who are like, man, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I didn't have anybody show me. I didn't have like, you know what I mean? And, and so we could have, so, so it's recognizing the trauma. Um, and then, and once you've done that, then it's dealing with it. It's, it's, I think part of the problem is we see it and then we don't want to touch it. We, you know, we try to get around it and it's like, well, no, no, we've got to deal with it. And the gospel gives us the ability to, to do that. When you talk about parenting and, and being specific in terms of sexuality, um, I think we need to raise, we, we definitely need to raise a generation, but we need to raise our children um, in an environment where, hey, I can disagree with you and love you. I, I feel like today, it's like if you disagree with anything that I'm saying, then it comes across as you've automatically said you don't yeah. love me. That's incorrect. I can disagree with you and love you deeply. Um, and, and so it's, that needs to come back to the forefront in some form of discipleship. Uh, the other thing I think about is understanding identity. Um, again, when we're talking about sexuality, but this cuts across everything, is what we've done is we've taken the thing and we've made it our identity. As Christians, th that couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. Like that's just, that's wrong. Like um, my sexuality is not my identity. My husbandry, I don't know if that's a word, if it, if it isn't, it is now, um, is not my identity. Uh, it's Happy Father's Day. You, you as a father, that is not your identity. That, those things flow from your identity. My identity as a Christian is that I'm a child of God. 
And, and so we've got to come back to that to go, listen, man, first and foremost, I want you to know that you are a child of God. Because it, when, you, when you get that, then everything else flows from there. That's how God has wired and designed us. And so we need to figure out in our discipleship how we have those kinds of conversations where it's not the, 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 my sexuality is my identity. So therefore, if you're denying my sexuality, you are denying who I am as a person. It's like, no, no, no. I want to first see you as an image bearer of God, how he has molded you and shaped you. And then everything that flows from that, let's have a conversation about what that's meant to look like. So that, that's another thing. Um, the pain, the trauma, the, the forgiveness that you spoke about, um, Clarence, is, is beautiful. I think of the bleeding, the wounded, and the traumatized. So I wrote that down. Like even as I'm hearing you, there are people who are bleeding, who are wounded, and who are traumatized. What do we see Jesus doing with those individuals? He is intentionally walking towards them. He is holding them. He is embracing them. I mean, the woman who, with the issue of, of bleeding for 12 years, the fact that he called her daughter in the presence of people that were like, we don't do, the church needs to do way better at that. Again, I'm not just talking about on the issue of sexuality, but everything, the foreigner, the orphan, the widow, the poor. Don't just talk about them. They need to see us come and wrap our arms around them and be like, hey, listen, I, like, I disagree with what you're doing and what you're saying, but I'm here and I love you. Let's talk through the, the wounds and the trauma and the, to show you that the gospel heals. Um, and, and, and as Jesus was doing that, his agenda was exactly the same. Jesus didn't change on preference. He didn't change on popular culture. He didn't change on like, if I say this and this is, you know, he was like, my agenda is the same. I have come so that you might know the Father. It's the same agenda, and our agenda doesn't change. So I might say some things that you may not like, and I get that, and I'm always trying to find ways to be loving and truthful. That's a difficult thing to do, um, but you've got to strike that balance. But my agenda is the same as I need you to know the Father. Because if you know the Father, then we're taking steps towards healing. But because you have denied the Father, or you've got this view of the Father that you think that's how He is, but in actual fact, God's going, that's not, that's not who I am. You've created an image of the Father so that it would make you feel like I can do X, Y, and Z. And we do this all the time. Let's just talk money. Like you'll create an image of God that He's like, that's not who I am, so I can hold on to my money. So that, so, so, um, it, it's, a, it's a massive, con it's a valid conversation, and we're seeing more and more and more of that happen, particularly in parenting. I mean, even at our schools, like the conversations that they're having with our kids, I was like, as a nine-year-old, we weren't talking about this. We're trying to figure out how to get the best BMX. So, so it is something that as a church, we need to equip one another with and, and potentially do more on, but, um, but that's valid, and, and, and those are my thoughts. I just I threw that down as I wrote the end. The, the, the tap on the at the, at the end. Um, thanks to the panelists. Great. Um, say if you if you had a, I'm gonna call the band up because the last time you guys wanted to crucify me without singing, I was ready to end the thing. But you guys, but I also want to say that if you need to go, um, then by all means you can slip out uh, as we sing. Um, but. Um, but I hope that you've enjoyed these last three weeks. And, and look, I know that they've been longer than we usually do. And um, it, it's, it's just, I believe, where God wanted us to be um, as we've walked through singleness, marriage, and parenting. And so much more could have been said um, that wasn't said. And so who knows, um, as we talk as a leadership, trying to figure out what are some other ways that we can have more of these, uh, have them kind of breathe, let them be longer, um, and maybe hit on some specifics uh, that maybe we couldn't address. Uh, this is more just an appetizer, an introduction for a lack of better words. I'm going to have you all stand um, as we close out in, in song. And, and, um, and as the band leads us in this last song, and I'll come up and give us a benediction, um, I want to say this in real quick summary. Uh, family matters, okay? It matters to God, and so it should matter to us. Uh, you matter. And so wherever you find yourself uh, on this journey, whether it's in the issue, singleness, if it's marriage, if it's parenting, if it's maybe something that we didn't talk about, but you're like, I'm pretty sure it lands in the category of family. I want you to know that we are here for you. That you were never created to live in isolation, but you were beautifully designed for fellowship. And we really mean that. And a lot of the things that you might bring are not going to be a simple uh, do this, do that. It's not going to be a simple black and white. There's a lot of gray in this room. 
but the gospel, the gospel navigates the complexities of our lives. We have a simple gospel that saves and a complex gospel that sanctifies, that has the ability to meet you where you are and draw you closer and closer to Jesus. And so that's my hope for you uh, throughout this sermon series is that you would be connected to the Father. My agenda, our agenda is the same agenda that Jesus was on and continues to be on. And that is to point us to the Father, to connect us to the Father so that we might know that we are loved more than we could ever imagine. Amen. Amen. And so with that, let me pray and then the band will close us out in song. And so Father God, thank you for your mercy and your goodness. Uh, we are truly loved more than we could ever imagine. And ever, whenever we doubt that, we look to your finished work on the cross. And so now as we sing, Father, I pray that we would sing these truths, believing them, believing them, because they speak of a Savior who has conquered sin, death, and Satan. And right now, Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Let's respond. Let's respond.